The year is 1600. The Spanish army, feared throughout South America and Europe with a large contingent of forces, is about to do battle with some Dutch boys. Now who do you think is going to win this battle? Place your bets here, have a good think about it, because in this video I'm going to explain why it's not who you think would win this battle. But a quick disclaimer, I am very happy to announce that this video is indeed a collaboration with my good friend Griffin over on the Armchair Historian channel, but a bit more about that later on, which is awesome. <laughs> During the second half of the 15th century, the English started to lose the Hundred Years' War against the French, and it was France that became the dominant political and military power of the time. Now, their armies during this period consisted largely of groups of assortments of infantry and heavy cavalry, which they called the gendarmes. Now, various groups had to fight against such heavy cavalry formations. The English famously used longbowmen behind stakes, as they did Agincourt and battles like Crécy, to fight against the heavy cavalry, the shock troops of the Middle Ages. Others, like the Swiss, however, when fighting enemies like the Burgundians at the Battle of Nancy, for example, used a formation called a pike square or a pike block. And this was also very effective at stopping much larger armies at times from being successful on the field of battle. Now, another group that the French were often fighting with were, of course, the Spanish. And it was the Spanish who founded the sort of dominant military formation of the 15th, or sorry, the 16th century. And this was called the Tercio. Now, the Tercio was essentially a formation that combined both pikemen and shot, so the early firearms, musketeers, although earlier on it would be arquebuses, which they would be using. And they would essentially be mixed together so that even if you had a lot of these men were able to fire from range and attack an enemy from range, the presence of cavalry on the field of battle meant that they were protected from the cavalry by the pikemen at the same time. So it was essentially a big block mismatch of pikes, swords, and various ranged weapons at once. And this was called the Tercio. Now, during this time, of course, the Spanish fought the 80 Years' War with the Dutch, who found it difficult to fight in the style of the Tercio because they had far fewer towns than the Spanish, who had a large empire from which to draw men, so they found it hard to field enough men, and when they did field men, they had far too many of them using firearms for the pikemen to protect. And it's true that the first engagements during the 80 Years' War were largely crushing defeats for the rebel armies led by the House of Orange, like at Dalen and Mokerheiden. Now, the Stadthouder of the Dutch, Maurits von Nassau, looked to old Roman and Byzantine military manuals for inspiration, looking at some famous tacticians and figures like Vegetius and Aelian, and as well the tactica of the Byzantine Emperor Leo. And he used these and found that they used far shallower formations for their Roman legions to fight effectively, and he drew on this for inspiration for how to defeat the Spanish and reform the army. Now, he placed a large emphasis on drill, Day in, day out exercises of simple motions to solidify these movements in the minds of the soldiers, mostly the musketeers and as well as updating the weapons. And also he decided that it would be a better idea rather than that they hired many mercenary soldiers to fight for them. Instead, he said no, they need to fight the entire year round instead of taking a few uh, months off during the off season of the campaign, he kept them drilling instead. And this meant that they became a lot more trained and that they now had a professional army. It was their only job to be soldiers in this army, which then again made the Dutch army, which was largely made up of foreign mercenaries at the time, as well as local Dutchmen, a much more effective fighting force. Now, he also standardized the equipment. People were using various types of weapons in various units, which were of various lengths and of various makes. And this, of course, meant that there was no real standardization. But when he did introduce this, he knew exactly what he could expect from each regiment because they were using the same. And commands were also regularized so that every unit in the army now heard the same command and knew exactly it is what he and the man next to him should be doing. Of course, this was so effective that it later became known as the Dutch Discipline, and this would go on to become the standard of European and later North American armies during the 17th and later 18th and or into the 19th and arguably until the First World War, because this was how armies then fought as it shifted from melee weapons to obviously firearms and then being used especially well by people like the Prussians who were famous for their drill and their discipline. Obviously, well-disciplined troops, well-drilled troops 
were better troops. And it really started here with Maurits of Nassau, again looking back to the Roman way of doing things, which he tried to emulate with this, as they had a very strong inkling towards being disciplined and well drilled before going into battle as this obviously made better troops. Now as well as this he looked at the Roman cohort as an example of of course these um, tertios and other units at the time during the 15th and 16th centuries were very large unwieldy and disorganized with pike and shot and saber and pistol and whatnot being thrown in together. However Maurit diced up these big unwieldy bodies of men into battalions which had an agreement amount of men in them, again looking back to the Roman idea of the cohort. Now each battalion, and you can tell immediately from even this picture of the Battle of Newport in 1600, which side is which, because of the different formations. On the left you can clearly see the new Dutch battalions which are much smaller, much more organised, and on the right you can see the traditional style of fighting that the Spanish had been doing for the last century and a bit, much larger blocks of infantry of pike and shot altogether. Now, now these battalions were very well organised and each battalion was meant to have 550 men, 300 musketeers and 250 pikemen, with 60 musketeers forming a skirmish line. Now the pikemen were to form up in the centre with the firearms on the flanks and this was for good reason. Pike rows were meant to be 5 to 10 ranks deep whereas the firearms were meant to go from 8 to 12 ranks deep and this was again very carefully chosen because the musketeers were chosen and they were trained in a formation known as counter march and the counter march tactic is essentially that there were intervals between the ranks so that when one line fired and remember we're talking 17th century so these aren't very rapid firing weapons at all it takes you know it would be at least i imagine a few minutes perhaps with these kinds of weapons to reload them fire them and then have to reload them again so what the counter march did was that it allowed one rank to fire then to trace back to the very end of the ranks, all the while reloading. Now, of course, this is only possible because of the excellent drilling techniques that Mauritz had also introduced, so that they knew exactly they would fire, then like a machine, like cogs in a machine, they would turn back and start to reload already while walking, while the next rank would then fire and then go to the back, and then you had 12 ranks exactly timed so that they had been drilled to be able to keep up a constant barrage of fire, because someone would always be, there would always be a rank at the front that was ready and reloaded, and that would fire off. With the Tercio formation, however, there's no saying if anyone would be ready to fire, and if there was a large cavalry charge massing, then it could spell disaster. Of course, that's why they had the pike there, but this new countermarch technique meant that the Dutch could keep up a rolling barrage against their enemies. Now, now of course cavalry still posed a huge threat, but this is why there were of course these pikemen in there. And when threatened by cavalry, the musketeers would simply funnel in behind the battalion's pikemen, who could then engage them just as the Swiss pike squares and Spanish tercios had done to devastating effect before. Now these reforms were used to great effect against the Spanish army at the Battle of Newport in 1600, when Mauritz led an army to victory using his new tactics and drill, showing just quite how effective they were. However, most of the engagements throughout the 80 Years' War wouldn't actually be battles. The vast majority of them would be sieges. And of course, the Dutch made huge advances in siege warfare during this time. Although, I don't think I'll quite have enough time to do that in this video. As well as, of course, naval warfare, which the Dutch truly did revolutionise once again. Hey Hilbert, thanks for collaborating with me on this topic. Remember that the evolution of warfare didn't stop with the revolutions of the Dutch and Swedish, but carried well on into the 19th and 18th centuries. You guys can check out my video on why soldiers fought in lines over at my channel, The Armchair Historian. Thanks. Do go and check out my friend Griffin, The Armchair Historian's channel, and the video on why did soldiers fight in lines, all about 18th and a bit of 19th century warfare, which I think you'll find really interesting, as well as his other stuff. He does animated history videos, which are really awesome and I think you would really, really enjoy. And a huge thanks, of course, to Griffin for helping me out and for making this collaboration with me today. So a quick note about me. I am sorry that I haven't uploaded in a little while. It's been a very busy time, but I have some very exciting news. Well, it's not really news because I'm going to keep it a secret because I'm like that. But I promise you something big is coming to the channel and I think you are really going to enjoy it. But I'll be leaving a few more clues as to that 
in the near future. So thank you very much for watching. If you couldn't tell, I am going to be making another part about this, possibly a few parts. The first one being how the Swedish revolutionized warfare, because while Maurits of Nassau sort of in the early 17th century started this process of drill and the Dutch discipline with the uh, first victory at Newport there, which really started to turn the tide in uh, the 80 years war, it was the Swedish under their King Gustavus Adolphus or Gustav Adolf the Lion from the North who who went on to continue to revolutionize warfare into something that would then go on into the 1800s and the 1700s, uh, which is really interesting. So I'll be making a video about that soon, as well as some others. So thank you very much for watching. I have, of course, been History with Hilbert. And thanks, of course, to the Patreons as well for making it possible for me to make this video. Go, go and check out the Armchair Historian, who I've had a lot of fun working with on this. And I hope to see you all again very soon.